Hi, welcome to our second voiceover video lecture on bones. On this video we will be looking at the classification of bones as well as talking a little about the structure of bones, both on a larger and smaller scale. So let's get started. What we have here is two very nice diagrams of a human skeleton. It is not quite in a perfect anatomical position in the anterior one, but don't let that confuse you. So the first way to divide our skeleton into two groups is based on the location of the bones. What we see here on bluish or turquoise color is the actual skeleton. It contains the skull, vertebral column and the rib cage. And that really is the trunk of the body. So the head, neck and the trunk. An appendicular skeleton instead is formed by the upper and lower limbs. If you think about it, if you have ever filed some official papers, there might be an actual document to fill in, but then you are asked to submit a supporting appendix or multiple of them. Or you have a body part called appendix, which is the very first parts of your large intestines, this little evolutionary remain that hangs there. And it can get sometimes inflamed and then removed. So you don't really need it per se. It is there to add something. Or support your file that you have prepared. So you can use that as a mnemonic for your appendicular skeleton too. The very vital organs are housed in the trunk and head of your body, while one can live without the limbs. We have people who have had to get those amputated and are still perfectly fine alive, so appendicular skeleton is the limbs. Not vital, but very beneficial to have. I do also want to highlight and draw your attention to where the axial skeleton ends and appendicular starts. For the upper limb, if you look at the back, shoulder plate, which we know in anatomy as scapula, and on the front, your collarbone, known properly as clavicle, they both are part of the appendicular skeleton. In fact, what you will end up finding is that it is only via muscles that the scapula is attached to the trunk, with the exception of the superior facets, and clavicle attaches only at the very top of the chest bone. And then for the lower limb, please note that the hip bones themselves are part of the appendicular skeleton, and only the vertebral column, which its lowermost parts included, are part of the axial skeleton. Here is a really nice summary of what we have just discussed, in case you want to review it further. So this, the division in two broad groups, is the first way how we may start to classify our 206 bones that we have in the body. Here, just for fun, is a little bit of comparative anatomy. Please note that I have flipped the colors we used earlier in reverse. So you notice, the same division can be applied to dogs or other animals too. Notice how in this also the scapula and hips are part of the appendicular skeleton. The other way how we may well start to classify bones is by looking at the shape of the bones. The first of these shapes would be the long bones. Here, for example, we see this humerus as an example of the long bones. What we end up finding is that they are often the major bones of the limbs. The way to characterize them would be by describing them as being longer than they are wide. The second of our types of bones, as per classification on shape, is short bones. 
These in comparison are more varied, but some good examples would include the carpal bones of the wrist and tarsal bones of the ankle. They are more cube-shaped. This group also includes many sesamoid bones within tendons, such as the patella or kneecap. The second last that I want to introduce is our flat bones. They are typically thin and flat, of course. They can also be slightly curved, as in case of ribs. Here we see sternum or chest bone as an example of the flat bones. Also, for example, scapula, the shoulder blade, and most skull bones would be good examples of this group. Finally, the last group is really, in my mind, kind of a scapegoat group. It is called irregular bones, and basically, we put there any bones that we cannot fit into other groups. These are complicated shapes, such as the vertebrae and the hip bones. I think that next we should look at the structure of bones, and we will start by looking at the larger scale, and then move on to more detailed study of the bones. Here, let's start by looking at the cross anatomy of the bones. We have two types that I want to introduce here. First, Compact bone is what we see typically as the outer layer of pretty much every bone. It is this smooth, dense, solid bone type. Some of our bones are fully compact bone, while many have outer layer of compact bone, and then the interior of the bone is made of spongy bone. Why would we do that? Well, the spongy bone, which is kind of looking like Swiss cheese, is much lighter. For example, think about the weight of the skull if it was made of the fully compact bone. We would have a very hard job carrying our head. And, again, a little comparative anatomy here. This is why birds are able to fly. Their bones are filled with much more spongy bone than human bones. This adaptation makes them light enough to be able to fly, while the bones are still durable enough to perform their function. And this is, by the way, why you should not let your dogs eat bones of the chicken or other birds. They have less strength and can break into splinters that can puncture their intestines. Now, next let's have a look of some of parts of the long bone that we do need to know. We can divide a long bone in three major parts. And the first one that I want to discuss is the diaphysis. It covers most of the bone's length, forming the shaft of the bone. It has a hard compact bone as the outer layer, which is, in fact, enclosed inside a periosteum, a thin connective tissue covering of the bone. And inside we have the bone cavity, where, for example, bone marrow is located. At the ends, we have epiphysis. These are mostly spongy bone, and at the very ends, there are articular cartilage. They serve a purpose of protecting, sliding, and reducing friction as one bone makes contact with another bone. Without this layer, we would have damage of the bone ends. Next, I want to introduce the epiphyseal line. This is often known as our growth plate in children and adolescents, and this is where the major growth of bone length happens from. In adults, epiphyseal plate is replaced with epiphyseal line. In fact, it is one of the characteristics that we often use when defining the age of a skeleton. Now, Let's zoom into this area inside the box. 
Here I want to highlight in particular the bone marrow. We discussed about this in our earlier video as the site where blood cells were made. The compact bone, which we covered just a moment ago when talking about how it forms the dense outer layer on bones, appearing smooth and solid for the outside of the bone. And Periosteum. It was the thin connective tissue covering on the outer surface of the bone, in particular in the diaphysis. These are numerous bone markings that I wish you to review independently using your textbook to guide you. Please go through these, paying attention to the projections that are sites of muscle and ligament attachments, projections that help to form joints, depressions and openings both for the passage of blood vessels and nerves and for other kind of openings and passageways. These terms will become important to you as we will be looking at the major bones of the skeletal system in more detail. And I will be expecting that you are familiar with these and comfortable using this language. Now, the other level of detail that we should consider is the microscopic anatomy of the bone. And this... For this, we need to look at important cell types. Your textbook will again include a little bit more detail, but there are a few cell types that I want to highlight here. I call these O cells, and they are only found in the bone. Please note that these are all specialized forms of the same basic cell type. So, First, osteoblasts. These are the ones that make new bone and control calcium and mineral deposition. When you look at these diagrammatic figures that I have provided, you will note that they have one nucleus inside them. And when they age, they become lining cells that regulate calcium passage and respond to hormones. The second type that we are going to discuss actually arises from these. They are mature bone cells, known as osteocytes. Uh, I often think of these cells' development as if one would have been washing a floor with a mop and doing so all around you until eventually you get trapped in as all around you the floor is wet and you are standing in the middle of the only dry spot. Well, this is uh, basically what happens to the osteoblasts as they mature. They get trapped inside the new bone that they have been producing all around them and now change into osteocytes. You can see that they have these long branches to connect with other cells. and Their function is to direct bone development by sensing pressure and cracks. And finally, we have osteoclasts. They break down old bone, dissolving it. Actually, they originate from the bone marrow, similar to the white blood cells. And another characteristic that you can see is that they have multiple nucleus. So here you have them. And to give you a quick and short summary, here is a very simplified description of each, as we just discussed. This is where we will finish now, and in our last video lecture of this chapter, we will pick up from these cell types of the bone, as we give a final look to the microscopic structure of the bone and consider how bone anatomy relates to the stress-controlling growth of the bone. We will also have a look of the formation of bone and some clinical relevance, like fractures.